Good morning. The text for this morning is from the Lord's Prayer. You'll be used to that by now. And we're going to be thinking on the clause, if that's the right word for it. My English was never very good at school. Uh, But it's the clause, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. But what I'd like us to do is to turn to James chapter 1. Don't forget what the text is for today. But let's read James chapter 1, and we're going to start at verse 2. And I I suspect it will be on page 1213 in many of your Bibles. Just give you a moment to look that up. So our text is, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. James 1 verse 2, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. But the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose us, sorry, he chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Amen. So which is it? Does God tempt us or not? Well, that was quite a resounding no. I was surprised at that. (laughs) And we've got this clause in the Lord's Prayer that says, Lead us not into temptation. Let me tell you, as far back as A.D. 192, a great theologian, Tertullian, said, Far be the thought that the Lord should seem to tempt, as if he were ignorant of the limits of someone's faith or even eager to overthrow that faith. He was questioning, why would we go through times of trial? and temptation but where does it come from now i know i'm standing up here and you're looking to me for the answers but i'm not going to give you the answers i can't do that all i can do is encourage you to look at what the bible says and anything i say weigh it up in the light of what the bible says now if you've got a a bible with footnotes and most of the nivs will have footnotes Some will have cross-references. They're the ones in the middle. But let's look at the footnotes first of all. If we're in Matthew 6 and verse 13, and it says, and lead us not into temptation, there's a tiny little letter A. 
And that is a hint for you to look at the footnote at the bottom. Right? And if you've got your Bible open, you can do it with me. It says, A, verse 13, the Greek for temptation can also mean testing. Okay, so is it lead us not into trials or is it lead us not into temptations? Okay, let's look a little bit deeper. If we go to the cross-references, which are those in the middle of the, the margin, and, and uh, I don't know whether you can see the column here, not everybody has a Bible with cross-references, but it's worth it if you can get hold of one. Uh, that gives us a reference in 6 verse 13 to James chapter 1 and verse 13. And chapter 1 verse 13 says, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. So what is it? If we read through the rest of James, uh, that passage that I shared with you, it, you can read into that that actually being tested is a good thing and it has great benefits. And you think, oh, well, that's the easy way to look at it. Uh, it doesn't mean temptations. It means trials. And because trials work good things in us, they're good things. But that begs the question, why then should we pray in the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation or into trials? You can't have it both ways, right? Now, the last time I was speaking to you, we were, we were looking at the clause that uh, says, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I pointed you to the story of Job, where uh, Job... God gave permission to Satan to test Job's faith. And it's there in Job chapter 1, and it comes again in Job chapter 2, and in case uh, you've, you've uh, forgotten that, let me read it to you. So this is the second time the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them to present himself before him. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil, and he still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. So this was the second occasion. And God said, Look at my servant Job, how faithful he is, you asked for permission, I gave it to you, he's maintained his integrity. But notice the last three words of that verse. When it says, you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. It's easy to overlook those words, but those words are very important. In John 15 and verse 25, and let me find the right tab so that I get the right reference. John 15, 25, Jesus said, this is to fulfill what is written in the law, they hated me without reason. And there are lots of times in the scripture when that phrase comes up. And from a human point of view, all too often we can wonder why God does allow us into times of trial and testing. Now the word that's used in the Lord's Prayer and the word that's used in James chapter 1 and verses 2 and 3 when it talks about counting it all joy when you come into times of trial is the same Greek word. Uh, they tell me it's pirasmos. I am not a Greek scholar. Look it up for yourself and see what that means. But it tells us that as a result of pyrasmos, as a result of what Jesus says we're praying, lead us not into, there is a crown of life reward for those who remain faithful to God. So is it trials or temptation? Think about the outcome of a trial. If you've ever faced a trial that you recognize as being a time of testing for your faith, 
what were the possible outcomes? One outcome is the good outcome. It's what James talks about. It's the strengthening of your faith. It's the example to others where they can be encouraged when you uh, remain faithful through suffering. You become closer to God. But what's the alternative outcome? If we summed it up in one word, it only has three letters. It's the word sin. If we don't stand up under trials, the result could be bitterness. It could be rebellion against God. It could be turning away from God and losing our faith. So whether the trials themselves are a temptation, there is definitely temptation in there and we need to be very careful and very diligent to ensure that we remain faithful to the Lord, whatever our trials may be. Jesus himself was led by the Spirit to be tempted. That comes in Matthew 4 and verse 1. Uh, it says distinctly, the Spirit led him into the wilderness. And if it was so for Jesus, temptation and testing must clearly be a part of the Christian life. Sorry, folks, but I've got to tell it like it is. This is what God says. Now, I'd like to commend to you a sermon that you can find online by one of the Baptist greats of years gone by, no less than Charles Haddon Spurgeon. You heard of him? Right? If you search for uh, Lead Us Not Into Temptation, C.H. Spurgeon, a sermon will come up for you to read. And it is well worth reading. And I'm going to nick something from it, shamelessly, but can I tell you that Spurgeon admits that he nicked this from some Sunday school material before he got up to preach. So uh, I'm not nicking it from Spurgeon himself, and he doesn't tell us where it comes from. But he says the Lord's Prayer is like a ladder, but it's like a ladder that goes downwards. It starts, Our Father in heaven. That's the prayer of a child. That's the top of the ladder. Then, hallowed be your name, is the prayer of a worshipper. Now, a worshipper has to make a conscious decision to recognize the, the greatness of God. And Spurgeon suggests that that's one down on the ladder. Then, your kingdom come, is the prayer of the subject, as in, we're subject of King Charles. We're in his kingdom. You have no choice about it, uh, unless you come from overseas and you've not been given British citizenship, but otherwise you're a subject. The prayer of a subject is the next rung down on the ladder and it's your kingdom come. And then your will be done on earth as it is in heaven is the prayer of the servant. Not all subjects are servants. You're a subject of King Charles, but you ain't his servant. All right? But he has a few, uh, as, as you can tell. And then the next one down, give us this day our daily bread, is the prayer of the beggar. We're getting near the bottom of the ladder now. And then, uh, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those that sin against us. That's the prayer of the sinner. But now we come to this prayer, lead us not into temptation. And Spurgeon suggests that this is the prayer of the sinner who is in danger of becoming a worse sinner. But then he goes on, and I'm actually going to read his words. I'm not going to try and uh, imagine how he would sound and imitate that. I'll just read it as it comes. And yet, dear friends, though I have thus described the prayer as a going downward, downward is in matters of grace much the same as upward. The downgoing process of the prayer might equally well illustrate the advance of the divine life in the soul. The last clause of the prayer contains in it a deeper inward experience than the earlier part of it. 
Every believer is a child of God, a worshipper, a subject, a servant, a beggar, and a sinner. But it is not every man who perceives the allurements which beset him, or his own tendency to yield to them. It is not every child of God, even when in advanced in years, who knows to the full the meaning of being led into temptation. For some follow an easy path and are seldom buffeted, and others are such tender babes that they hardly know their own corruptions. Fully to understand our text, a man should have had sharp brushes in the wars and have done battle against the enemy within his soul for many a day. He who has escaped as by the skin of his teeth, offers this prayer with an emphasis of meaning. The man who has felt the fowler's net about him, the man who has been seized by the adversary and almost destroyed, he prays with awful eagerness, lead us not into temptation. Google it. Lead us not into temptation. C.H. Spurgeon, it's fantastic. And there he's saying, that our attitude to sin, our awareness of our own weakness is a mark of maturity as a Christian. And if sin doesn't trouble us, we need to examine ourselves before God. God can use trials and temptations to reveal what's in our hearts. Lots of examples in the Bible. Abraham and Isaac. Abraham was uh, challenged to go and sacrifice his son on the altar. And he went. He endured the trial. God provided a, a sacrifice as an alternative for Isaac, which is a great picture of Jesus and his sacrifice for us. But Abraham was commended for his faith under trial. And he's even quoted in the book of Hebrews, in the gallery of faith, because of what he did. But what about David and Bathsheba? David sinned. He went through a trial and he didn't pass the test. But as a result of that, he became more acutely aware of his own sinfulness. But Saul, his predecessor, when he was called out, he didn't repent. And he became a warning to the nations. And there are lots of others, Samson, who uh, uh, flirted with uh, the kind of woman God had forbidden his people to mix with. And it says in the end, when he gave away the secret of his strength, uh, and then he was under attack, he got up as at former times, and he didn't know that his strength was gone from him. God has a great way through trials to reveal what's in our hearts. But God can also use trials and temptations to enable us to understand holiness with more clarity. I'm sure David, his relationship with God after his sin with Bathsheba was somewhat different because it was marked with the scars and the memory of what he had done. And that would have made him strive more earnestly to want to be holy before God. And yes, God forgives sin. But there are consequences to sins that sometimes we cannot erase and blot out. Another thing God can do through trials is to strengthen our wills. I'm currently, uh, I've just turned on Friday to, to Timothy. Uh, and as I've said to you before, I'm reading a chunk of the Bible every day for a week. So to Timothy's a relatively short book, but I've just finished 1 Timothy, and in chapter 4, verse 7, when Paul is writing to this young Christian leader, Timothy, he says, train yourself to be godly. Training, if you've ever trained for anything uh, significant, training is not easy. It's hard. Sometimes it's painful. But you have to be disciplined in order to ensure that you get to be the best that you can be. And Timothy is encouraged by Paul in 1 Timothy 4, 7 
to train himself to be godly. Martin Luther said, my temptations have been my masters in divinity. And then we can, through our trials and enduring trials, we can provide an example to others. So let's go back to this question. If trials are such a good thing, why pray against them? The thing is this, we may be the object of this prayer, but God is the subject. And whoever prays the Lord's Prayer, sorry, okay, what I'll do is I'll put it on here and I'll not wiggle about so much. Okay. might make a difference okay right uh, we may be the object of this prayer but God is the subject and we are praying for God's will to be done in our lives but much like Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane he prayed if it's possible let this cup pass from me nevertheless not my will but yours be done and we can take this prayer in exactly that light. That we, if we're honest, we don't want to be tried. We don't want to be tested. When I was at school, I didn't want to do exams. But the exams were necessary to show the level of my achievement, uh, the level of my understanding. And so our trials are there for a purpose that God has. And our primary concern should not be about the trials, but it should be about the sin that may result. Avoiding sin should be our primary concern. In Luke 22, uh, verses 31 to 32, Jesus is talking to Simon, Peter, and he says, Simon... Simon, he repeats his name for emphasis, Satan has desired to have you and sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your strength will not fail. Psalm 141, the psalmist says, do not let my heart be drawn to what is evil. Avoiding sin should be our primary concern. And there are ways that we can ensure that we do just that. As I came down this morning, uh, I came over the level crossing on Granham's Road, which many of you will be familiar with. And I don't know if you've ever noticed that as you go from this direction to go up Granham's Hill, on the right, immediately before the level crossing gates, against the fence, there is a little, what looks like a car parking space. Have you ever noticed that? And every time I've come past, I've thought, who does that belong to? And sometimes when I come past, there's a, uh, I was going to say British Rail, but whoever it is now that runs the railways, they have a van parked in there, network rail. Um, a van parked in there, and I'm not sure if they're just guarding the level crossing because they say on a little sign that there's they do patrol, or whether they're waiting for somebody else to come and they're going to do some work, I don't know. But I thought, is that railway property because it's outside the fence? Does it belong to the house next door? Do you know what I noticed this morning? Somebody has put three raised beds in that parking space. Now that's a great way to stop somebody parking on your land. And I thought, what a great illustration. When we're called to resist sin and to avoid sin, is don't leave empty spaces in your life. Fill them with good things so that the devil can't get a foothold. So remember that next time you're going over that level crossing. But praying this prayer reminds us that we can't overcome sin by ourselves. Imagine the opposite kind of prayer. Imagine the Christian who is so full of pride, he says, go ahead God, let me have it. I can take it. 
yeah. I think the moment this trial came, they would buckle under. And this prayer is a reminder that we can't do it by ourselves. Satan in the Bible uh, is called the tempter, the prince of this world, the strong man. Even in 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, he's called a prowling lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's trying to imitate Christ, the Lion of Judah. He's trying to get people to follow him instead of Christ. But Revelation 12 tells me his reign is short. His days are numbered. And you and I, through the grace of God, can have the power to resist him and to endure trials without uh, falling guilty of sin. And finally... This is a prayer of humility and of trust. We have promises in the scripture that we can cling to. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13. Uh, if you've never memorized this verse, this is a great one. And I recommend you do it. 1 Corinthians 10 13. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Isn't that great? But maybe, maybe one or two of you here are feeling a bit sore when we talk about a subject like this and you look at your own life and you think, I struggle with this. I've failed. What hope is there for me? Well, here's another promise. Isaiah 42 the writer says, Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. This is talking about Jesus. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. And when you hear that, you think, wow, he's going to have a big voice and everybody's going to be hearing and listening. But then it says, he will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break. And the smouldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. If you feel like a bruised reed, let me assure you because it's what the Bible says, not what I say, that God is merciful and gracious. He will forgive, he will strengthen and he will help and encourage you as you walk with him. Let's rely on those promises. Thank you, Sarah.